something I haven't mentioned before on the channel. For about nine years, I was a field investigator for MUFON, Mutual UFO Network. I investigated um, UFO sightings. During the pandemic, a lot of our meetings were held online. And we had a couple presenters that are amazing, just amazing. On my channel, I'm gonna share with you on my channel, on this channel, um, a few things. Down in the description, there'll be links to one, MUFON, two, co-MUFON, Colorado MUFON, uh, Mutual UFO Network, that's the chapter that I was a member of, uh, and then the author themselves. Um, enjoy, these are, these are good presentations. My name is Kurt Jaimungle. I'm a filmmaker. My background is in math and physics, which naturally leads me to the topic of UFOs because unlike most of the scientific community or even academia at large, I don't see UFOs as being relegated to only those who are loons, let's say. In fact, in this episode, I use that word loon, but I'm more referring to what the perception of people who believe in UFOs are. I don't believe that's true. I don't think that thousands of people can be this incorrect, although there is obviously that chance. But I'm willing to look into this topic and treat it seriously, especially from the angle of physics, because if there's craft here, and aliens and so on, if there's craft here, extremely advanced craft, the way that they operate to me seems to indicate new physics. Even the way Bob Lazar, whether or not you believe Bob Lazar, even the way Bob Lazar described the physics working was that there was something called a strong force, and that once it's outside the domain of the atom, it translates into what's called gravity number two at least he calls it that now that i haven't seen in any textbook the standard model is famous for not being able to unify gravity and and itself so i'm unclear as to how that works either way it's extremely extremely interesting if you'd like to support more conversations like this then please do consider supporting at patreon.com slash kurt jaimungle or even paypal paypal tends to go a bit more to me, but that's fine, whichever one works for you. Coming up in about a month, I'm speaking to Luis Elizondo, and so if you want, please email me, let me know the questions that you have. You can go to Theories of Everything, search that on YouTube, and you'll find the channel. Thank you so much, and enjoy this podcast with the great Kevin Knuth. He's a physics professor, a, an extremely brilliant physics professor, who's taking this topic seriously. And so, well, I'm interested. And judging by the fact that you're still watching this, you are as well. Enjoy. I just finished up an interview with Kevin Knuth. Kevin Knuth is a physicist at the University of Albany. Someone who I reached out to because he's one of the rare individuals interested in the phenomenon of UFOs, aliens, UAPs, whatever you would like to call them. And he's a respectable physicist, more than respectable. In fact, I didn't realize how excellent, creative, originative he is until I started researching about him after I had already booked the interview and then I found out that not only is he interested in aliens which is uh, it's not a goal of this channel at all I'm more interested in the physics of aliens and what they have to say about consciousness as well as our role in the universe not only is he interested in that but he's done significant research into the fundamental laws of physics with him and his colleagues conceiving of a theory called influence theory. We'll get into that. The conversation is pretty much two parts, aliens and then fundamental physics. I didn't expect to get along with Kevin anywhere near as much as I did. He probably to me was one of the guests I felt the most relaxed with for whatever reason. Maybe our personalities drive at some unconscious level. I don't know what it is, but hopefully you enjoy listening to the conversation as much as I had having it. Please, if you're interested in seeing or listening to more conversations like this, then consider donating at patreon.com slash Literally every one of those donations helps not only financially, but motivationally. Thank you and enjoy. I watched several interviews over the last few months since we first um, connected. When was it? Early, I guess, late fall or something. Mm -hmm. So I've watched several interviews. They're always they're really engaging and, and interesting. 
and and I, and, I, and, I, and I feel jealous. You get to talk to all these interesting people. <laughs> Two hours of just one on one, which is quite nice, right? That's hard to hard to get. Which one did you like the most? If you don't mind me asking. Yeah. Um. That, no, that's a good question. Um. And please, I don't mean to put you on the spot. If you're actually, if you're being overly polite and saying that you watched that, I don't no, mean to put no, you on no. the spot. No, no, I'm trying to. I'm trying. To, I, I enjoyed Eric Weinstein's. That was, he was a lot of fun to watch. Um, yeah, he was quite dynamic. I've been super excited to talk to you. When I first contacted you, it was because you had a paper. Still do a paper out on UAPs. I believe they're called, which is the UFOs essentially. For those who are listening, analyzing them. And you're a physics professor, so you're not some, let's say, loon from the periphery. And I thought, okay, that's interesting because very few academics actually pursue this. And I assume you're tenured, so very few tenured people, let alone non-tenured, pursue this. And then I realized you had some papers. Look, this is a channel on theories of everything, which means we explore the foundations of mathematics, the foundations of physics. You have many papers. You've been thinking about this for quite some time. So you turned out to be far more interesting than I had initially thought. And that's not a slight. That's actually a huge compliment because I see that you're able to derive spin and probability and space time. When I say probability, I mean the way that it's used in quantum mechanics and momentum from relatively simple ingredients. I was just reading about that recently. That is fun. We're going to talk about that later. If you don't mind. No, that sounds, that's great. It's one of my favorite topics, so. Thank you for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. I, I'm really looking forward to this. For those listening or watching, there's going to be an exordium on aliens first. If you're mainly interested in the foundations of physics, then look at the timestamps and view or listen to accordingly. We're going to talk about aliens. Why don't you tell us about the Benthoon encounter from 1951? Uh, right. So that, that encounter happened um, in 1951. Um, Graham Bethune was, um, he was a Navy, Navy pilot. They were summoned to Iceland, to Reykjavik, to, because the, the, in Iceland they were having problems with a UFO operating in the area. And um, I think it was operating in a maybe near an airport or somewhere sensitive. I don't recall exactly what the difficulty was. And they were summoned there to basically check this out and help them out with this problem. Um, they got there, not, not, didn't see anything. The thing with this, the thing was gone by that time. And they were heading back across the Atlantic from Iceland um, toward Newfoundland. And while they were flying. Um, they had, they saw lights on the surface of the water, on the ocean below, and it looked like city lights, and at first they thought they were, they were out of, um, off course, and so they double-checked their course and realized, no, they're on course, and they thought, well, there must be ships, maybe naval ships operating in the area or something, and, and, um, and as they got closer, the um, these lights were basically it was a disc-shaped light, um, a ring, I guess, and it appeared to be under the water. And as they approached this thing, this thing shot up from the sea surface to their altitude in very short period of time, like a matter of um, a second or two. And the and this. It was basically a large, um, large disc. I think he described it as being uh, 300 feet across. I probably I need to. I actually printed out my paper here to remind myself some of these details. There's a lot of cases, and um, yeah, so it was several hundred feet across. Um, the disc was slightly below their altitude, so they could actually see this disc. It had um, like glowing around the periphery. And as the object moved, um, the the color of the light would change. So, um, and I think it's been described as looking like a plasma. So this object basically was with them for several for several minutes. They basically steered um, one of the one of the I, one one person wanted to steer toward it, so they they steered toward it, and um, and eventually the thing took off. 
but it was seen by pretty much everybody on on board. Um, I think there were like on the order of 20 people or so on board uh, who witnessed this thing. So this thing then took off and they estimated its speed um, as it left to be about 1,500 miles an hour, which is about what was picked up on radar. They were close enough to Newfoundland that they were able to detect this on radar and they confirmed that later. When they say that it changed colors of the lights as it moved, yeah, is that akin to the Doppler effect, or is that something different? It's something different, I think, because it was it would go from like a violet, a red violet to a yellow, and basically within those ranges, and and I don't remember which way it went when it was when it was moving. It was yellow when it was stationary. It was red. I think that's basically how it was. That that detail I might not recall properly. What do you attribute as the cause of that, or the reason for that? I don't know. I, I mean, it's hard to figure out. You know, I try to treat th these observations as evidence, right? We're basically trying to do some kind of physics detective work to try to figure out what is this thing? How is it operating? How does it fly? You know, these are all the questions. How does it move so fast? These are the questions that come to me as a physicist. And um, a lot of times these, the light emitted by these things appears to be a plasma. So um, it could be that you're basically, the object is ionizing the air around the craft and that's what's emitting the light. And then as the object moves, you basically, maybe it's changing the electric fields around the object and, and then changing the, um, the excitation and the gas. Hmm. Okay, Professor, <clears throat> how did you get interested in this subject? You're not a fool. You're not just some loon. You're not some, what someone would think of as the stereotypical person who studies alien encounters or professes that aliens exist or UFOs or whatever it may be. How did you get into, what, what started you off on this journey? I'm a physicist, so I'm curious. Um, and I'm often surprised at how uncurious some of my colleagues are, but the yeah so i'm curious about these things and i've always been curious and when i went to graduate school it would have been in the fall of 1988 it was probably about our second first or second week in graduate school so it was in september of 88 there was a um, cattle mutilation um, i was at bozeman montana and the there was a cattle mutilation and i'd never heard of anything like a cattle mutilation. I grew up in Wisconsin and we have cows in Wisconsin and, and I've heard of cow tipping, but um, who's going to mutilate a cow? That's horrible. So I had, I was pretty shocked by this and there were a lot of people um, concerned about this on the news. They didn't know whether it was alien or if um, if there were Satanists involved and there were lots of theories floating around. So we were discussing this in the, um, we were discussing this in the hallway, then the new graduate students, the ones who basically moved, moved to Montana and had never heard of this before were discussing this. And, um, and it was a very heated discussion, very passionate and <laughs> everybody's upset and worried and wondering what the heck's going on. What kind of crazy place did we just move to um, and are gonna have to spend four or five years here. So, um, <clears throat> so this was really our concern. And while we were talking, one of the professors came out of his office and um, came down the hall to see what was, you know, we were so excited about and we told him, what we were discussing and he said yeah that's that's interesting he said it's th this happens here we don't really know they never figure out how the cows were mutilated and why and there's very often ufos seen in the area around the time so it's so it's interesting but it's never figured out and we just move on and you know we i don't i don't think that helped calm us at all and he then said but what's very strange what's even more interesting he said i have a, a number of friends in the air force um up at malmstrom air force base and they have trouble with ufos flying over the missile sites shutting down our icbms 
And this was in 1988? This is 1988, I was told this by a professor at Montana State University. And now, <clears throat> now I'd never heard this before. In fact, I didn't hear about this publicly until I think around 2010 when Robert Hastings had a press conference um, with uh, people from the Air Force, from Malmstrom Air Force Base. And so, to be honest, we, when the professor walked away, we, we laughed about it. I mean, you know, there's UFOs shutting down nuclear missiles, and... He was a professor of what? What was his he specialty? Was a physics, he was a physics professor. What particular field I of physics? I don't was? remember who it was, because it was my first week there, and I didn't know all the professors. Mm -hmm. okay. I have I have a guess who it could be, but I don't but I don't want to say because yes, because yes, yes. I don't know for sure. Yeah, um, have you ever tried to reach out to that person afterward? Um, no, I haven't. Um, it's unfortunately I'm at that age where a lot of my professors are have passed away, so so I didn't try reaching out. I probably that probably would be a good idea though. Okay, continue. That's a good suggestion. Thank you. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, so we, um, so we laughed about it, and then it, it was kind of a running gag through the whole semester, you know, and then, oh, and, you know, there are UFOs shutting down our nuclear missiles, and, you know, we would always giggle about that, um, but it really just seemed unthinkable because our... Our millet, these are restricted, these are restricted areas. If, if we have somebody coming in shutting down our nuclear missiles, our military, if a foreign nation did this, we would go to war over it and probably nuclear war because the nuclear missiles are involved. And so, so it's unthinkable that we wouldn't do anything. And so it was really hard to believe. And it just, you know, I just remember the event. It was just something somebody said once and and went on. And it wasn't until um, maybe 2015 or so that I was preparing for an astronomy class. And I had, we were going to talk about astrobiology, and I had some students asking me about the possibilities of aliens visiting Earth and and wanted me to talk about that. So I was online looking for papers, anything that I could, you know, could use to put out together a, a reasonable lecture on the topic. And I stumbled on the um, Robert Hastings um, press conference and where he had, I think, six people um, all working at, at nuclear missile sites. I think three of them were from Malmstrom Air Force Base. And and I started watching this, and I was just watching with disbelief, thinking, oh, my God, I heard about this in 1988. And the professor who told me then said it was going on then. It was in the present, happening in 1988. And these people in the press conference, um, Robert Salas, Salas was one of the prominent people. Um, he was talking about an event in 1966. And I thought, well, wait a minute, you can't have... A crazy story like this, if somebody's making this up in 1966, it's not going to persist until 1988. These are professionals, and they're serious professionals. They have to have, you know, clearance and specialized training, and and and, and these are secure areas. They, they're not, they're not nutcases, and they're not going to joke about things like this, and certainly not for 20 years. And, and I thought there has to be something to this. Something must be going on. And and I thought, this really has to be real. I can't see any other way around it. Um, and I can imagine, and at that point, I could imagine that we don't do anything because the assumption is that it can't be real, so let's not do anything. <laughs> and, and and I think that's why there's been a lot of inaction and, and lack of interest. I'm going to share my screen and then you're going to, if you don't mind, please tell me what is going on here. Okay, with this. Ah, right. <clears throat> so basically, what I'm basically doing here is if you, let's see, so they were estimating, they, they, so Graham Bethune this is, said that it took... Yeah, this is from 1951. This right, is not so took, from Japan or Nimitz. 
Right. So, so here the panel C. I work from panel C because so they were they estimated the um, the distance to be about five to seven miles away. So he wasn't exactly sure how far away it was, and so what I did basically is I I used a um, basically. He's estimating this looking out from the plane. He's looking down at an angle in front of the plane. And so I I treated that angle to have some uncertainty. So he's going to be off by, and I think I say what it is in the in the paper. He's off, you know, potentially off by so many degrees. So so what I did is I did a Monte um, Monte Carlo sampling where I basically randomly sampled um, angles with a Gaussian distribution about the angle that, you know, he would have been looking or thought that he was looking. And um, and that gives you a distribution of distances. So I'm basically doing a Monte Carlo sampling to um, take into account potential errors. My question, the, the question I've always asked when, you know, when pilots are confronted with these stories is my the question that comes to my mind is how how wrong could they be um, these are trained individuals um, millions of dollars go into their training which doesn't mean they're perfect um, but but then then that begs the question how imperfect are they how how wrong could they be about you know some of these facts and <clears throat> And I can imagine, you know, when, so for instance, if they estimate the size of the object as being 300 feet across or something, um, how wrong could you be with that? Well, maybe it was 100 feet across, but it certainly wouldn't have been 30. I mean, nobody's going to mistake yes. a 30-foot disc for a 300-foot disc. Well, you and wouldn't so, even be able to see that if you're five miles away approximately. So he's five that, miles away and he's looking down and he's able to down, discern yeah. it? Yeah. Five miles away, huh? And he was able to see that it looked like city lights? Yeah, it looked like a, it was a circle, circular group of lights. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Okay, now let's look at this. And then you estimated the altitude. And also, by the way, just as a technical aside, why are you, are you using Monte Carlo? It seems like, just uh, help edify me here, it seems like you have a Gaussian distribution or some sort of distribution. Why not just use that distribution? Why do you have to then sample it so that it's spiky at the edges? Oh, I, I use I could have used that distribution. The problem is that you'd then have to, in estimating... Um, in estimating the speed of the object, I then have to basically use the uncertainties in each of those quantities that go into calculating the speed of that object. And so it requires transforming, you know, all of these probability distributions, which is quite tedious. Okay. And so doing uh, it with Monte Carlo, doing it with Monte Carlo, I'm going to get appropriate answers, and it's a faster way to do it. Uh, otherwise, I might have to take approximations and things like this to pull it off analytically, which I didn't want to have to do. I see. The computer can't do that? It's not as simple as putting it into Wolfram Alpha? Well, from Alpha or Mathematica? No, not always, because you've got to, I mean, you're, you're, um, you're taking derivatives and inverses and things like this. You've got, so. Okay, and if you see me looking off over here, it's that I also have some of the studies on this side as well. So please, ah, okay. I'm not, you're the only thing I'm paying attention to. No, that's fine. <laughs> then you got times going on here. You have altitude and you have minimum log 10. Okay. Well, that's the acceleration. That's the acceleration. Altitude. All right. Okay, altitude and times. And these are referring to... The altitude is referring to what? The altitude is referring to the... Basically, the altitude of the craft. So how how far it went up from the sea surface. Great. And then the time is referring to how long did it take from the sea that's surface how long to it that took. altitude? Yep. Okay, okay. Simple, simple, simple. Great. Now, let's... Let's get to Japan Airlines flight 1628 in 1986. Right. That was that's another instance where I knew about that incident in 1986. I remember watching it on NBC News with Tom Brokaw and I remember um him discussing this and then playing some of the um some of the audio from the pilot uh, and the air air traffic control. And I remembered thinking that this is really pretty amazing. You've got a, you've got a, um, 
you've got a large um, jet, what is it, 747, I guess it was, um, and it's basically flying from, they were flying from Paris, Paris to Tokyo, bringing Beaujolais Nouveau. So here, now we can all have a giggle, ha ha ha, he's got a plane full of uh, wine, right? Um, mm -hmm. But, <laughs> so... So that's what but, the aliens were after all along. That's right. And you were an undergrad at this point? I was an undergrad at the point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Studying yeah. math and physics. Math and, and physics, physics, yeah. Okay, great, great, great. Yeah, so <clears throat> so the um and you can actually still find the um news reports online, the videos, people have put them online, but the um so as they're flying, they're approaching Anchorage, Alaska, and um, they see some lights in the distance basically approaching the plane. And so they're concerned, so they call um, air traffic to control to see if they have any traffic for them. And air traffic control says negative. Um, they said, well, we see traffic. <laughs> there we've got um, several craft approaching. And so they're very concerned about this. As so they're approaching Anchorage, they have um, two craft approaching, and then um, and then shortly thereafter, a larger craft approaches, and the thing is walnut shaped and glowing. And at one point, it's it's in front of the aircraft, and the pilot described it as so big that they couldn't see out of the windscreen. So I mean, you're a, you're a pilot of a jet, and <laughs> you've got a, something in front of you that you can't see beyond. That's a scary prospect. Um, so he's panicked and and calling air traffic control, and they don't they're not picking anything up on radar except his plane. Um, and at some point, the military is contacted and gets involved. And on military height finding radar, they pick up um, the larger craft on the plane and the airplane. So they pick up both objects. So, so the so the military is able to detect this with their radar. Um, Were you able to estimate the size of the craft? Um, no, uh, he estimated it to be um, the size of, I think it was three seven forty sevens. So it's basically the size of an aircraft carrier. So you've got In a sky. You've hmm. got a flying aircraft carrier shaped like a walnut. Um, <laughs> now you then you have to ask. How wrong can the pilot be? I mean, it's all right. Maybe it wasn't as big as an aircraft carrier. Maybe it was just the size of a destroyer. Still, that's pretty amazing, right? Um, he said it was glowing. And he glowing, yeah. And this was at night. Um, I, I don't know what time it happened. I don't recall. Mm -hmm. That's all. That's all recorded, but I don't recall off the yeah, top yeah, of my sure. head. Is that it with the Japan Airlines flight, or is there more? No. Well, the thing, the the interesting thing is the object follows him for forty minutes. So it isn't just like I saw it; it was gone. No, this thing basically kept track, kept along with the airplane for forty minutes, and it basically moved mm -hmm. around the aircraft, uh, moved around the airplane um, as time went by. So it would go. F <clears throat> so the military height finding radar and this radar data exists. Um, you can look at this. The military height fingering radar is sweeping every 10 seconds, and the um, craft is about seven and a half miles away from the airplane. And in one sweep, it'll be at one o'clock. In the next sweep, 10 seconds later, the thing could be at six o'clock. And so the thing is literally jumping around this airplane, and the pilot's panicked. He actually takes some evasive maneuvers at some point. Um, to try to evade the object, and thought that he had, he didn't see it, and the um, Air Force comes on and goes, no, it's behind you. <laughs> it's still following you. It's behind you. So um, the thing basically followed him for 40 minutes, and and then he went down and landed. <clears throat> when you said that the pilot said that he couldn't see beyond the ship, if it's five miles away and it's the size of a carrier why can't you see beyond it you can see the edges of it no oh well this one was moving around so so at some point at one point it was very close he had said and I see, it was I see. initially he okay. couldn't see initially he couldn't see beyond it so initially how close do you estimate it was to him i have no idea um okay. let's say that's... it was the size of a carrier then it would have to be i'm sure that's a, that's a simple close. trigonometry okay yeah yeah you could figure out how close it would have to be for much of the event, it was about seven and a half miles away, according to the radar. Hmm. And the sweeping, I, I'm sorry, it wasn't 
10 seconds, it was 12 seconds. So it was every 12 That's seconds. Great. Okay. This data exists, meaning that it's public. Yeah. The radar, the radar data. Yeah. The... How does that go online? Does someone leak it or does someone release it? Right. It was um, John Callahan, who was FAA chief of accidents and investigations at the time. Um, they basically reenacted the situation in one of their um, one of their um, testing centers, and they record the, and that's where all the data comes in, so they can reenact it. And then they rec he recorded that and basically saved that himself. He saved a copy for himself. And he claims that at one point the um, President Reagan's scientific advisory team. Um, met with him along with um, CIA, CIA officials and FBI and a number of people, and they confiscated all of the data he had, um, although he didn't tell them about everything. He had some of it stashed away. But they met with him, and they were very excited because they said that this was the longest um, encounter that they had um, had any data for. <clears throat> Okay, let's get to the Nimitz encounter. I'm sure many people are familiar because that's David Fravor, if I'm correct. Right. Okay, and that's in 2004, I believe? Right. Okay, why don't you give a brief rundown for the people who are unacquainted with this? All right, so in 2004, you had the, the Nimitz um, carrier group was, was um, off the coast of San Diego, California, um, about... Uh, about 100 miles, 150 miles off the coast. And um, Senior Chief Kevin Day was um, operating the radar uh, for much of this time. And for <clears throat> overall, for a period of, of a couple of weeks, he was picking up um, anomalous um, radar targets, appearing, basically just appearing on his radar at about 80,000 feet, which was really very of uh, very high altitude. Um, jet airplanes, passenger jets fly around 35,000 feet. So these radar targets are appearing at about 80,000 feet, and they typically were appearing south of Catalina Island or near San Clemente Island, and then they would track south at about 100, 120 knots, um, down to Guadalupe Island in, in Mexico, where they would then drop off as radar. And so we, nobody knows what happened to them after that. Um, so having an aircraft um, flying at 80,000 feet at only 100 knots is almost impossible. There's not much air up there, so you, you need to go much faster to have lift. So that's already anomalous. The, the, so this is anomalous in the other direction. They're moving too slowly, <laughs> right? Um, so, and Kevin Day had observed these and, um, you know, they weren't in the operating, they weren't where they were operating, so this wasn't really a big concern at this point. Um, and at one point he, um, he, he, well, he said that there were times when they would drop from they, well, they came in at 80,000 feet when they appeared. They would, they would drop down to 28,000 feet, and that's when they would track south at, at 100 knots. So, so even at 28,000 feet, you aren't going to be flying at a, a plane at 100 knots. But from 28,000 feet, they would periodically drop down to the sea surface, and that amount of time to go from, tw from basically at a constant altitude, 28,000 feet, to sea surface, which is zero, um, they would do that in about 0.78 seconds. So it was less than a second to go from basically rest in the Y direction at 28,000 feet to rest in the Y direction at zero feet. Okay. Now to interject, how long would that take if it was free falling? Um, uh, I'd have to do the calculation, but it would be... Let's say estimated to a significant digit. It's fine. You can be off by a factor of 10. Right, so the time is going to be um, basically twice the height, twice the height divided by the acceleration. The acceleration is about 10, uh, 10 meters per second squared, 28,000 feet. Two times 8,000 is 16,000, and now I'm going to divide that by 10 meters per second squared, and I'll get 
So that's 16,000 divided by 10, which is 1,600. And then we take the square root of that. So that's going to be uh, 40. 40 seconds? 40 yeah. seconds. Okay. It's, okay. I, they did it in one second. So that means... Yeah, less than less than one second, yeah. Okay. And, and, and they came to a, and, and they came to a stop. <laughs> Let's say our fastest accelerating technology downward, whatever that is, whatever kind of craft that is, how fast approximately do you think we could do it? Right. If you could dive at 10 G... <laughs> Um, acceleration and then slow down for the other 10 G then um, you're basically going you're accelerating halfway so we can find the time to the halfway point um, but if you work this out it's it's one quarter um, it'll be one quarter AT squared so so the total time is going to be basically so we've got 32,000 divided by a hundred so that's 320 seconds squared so then now we have to take the um basically the square root of 320. so it's eh, it's less than 400 the square root of 400 is 20 so it's going to be a little less than 20 seconds mm -hmm. okay let's take a look at some more i'm going to share my screen with you and just so what are we looking at over here this is the nimitz video and then we got different models and we have what is log Z, what is log L, what is A, what is, and so on. So All right. Yeah. So what we're doing is we're testing different um, dynamics, uh, kinematic models. These are these are basically in in this section of the paper we're analyzing the the video that was released by the U.S. Navy. And the last the last few seconds of that video, thirty two frames or something. Um, the object is locked on, it begins, the, the targeting system is locked onto the object and it loses lock and the object takes off to the left. Now it's not a very impressive departure um, and none of these videos are nearly as interesting as what the pilots describe these things as doing. Um, so I'm, I'm convinced we were given probably the most boring videos they could find. Um, and very possibly videos they didn't expect anything anomalous to, to come from. So that acceleration doesn't look very dramatic, but um, so we so we basically tested several models. One of, one of the models is that it, it accelerated, um, just accelerated off the screen, so it's constant acceleration. Another one was it accelerated for a shorter period of time and then um, just coasted off the screen at constant velocity. And um, and so those are the basic models we, we were testing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so and why do you think it is that they didn't do you believe that they have more interesting footage and they chose to release this? They being the U.S. government. Yeah, I'm, I'm just guessing that based on what the pilots have, have, you know, what numerous pilots have said in these types of encounters, um, these things behave much more amazingly than than the footage they you know, they released. So David Fravor, when he encountered the, the Tic Tac object and it finally took off, he said it accelerated like it was shot from a gun and it was gone in, you know, out of sight in two seconds. So um, clearly this acceleration isn't that fast. So it's so. So that's what Why I mean do you by think that. it is that they released the video, if you were to speculate at all, the U.S. government. Um, that I don't, that I don't know. I know that, um, Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon were working on the inside to try to get some of this information out, um, because they weren't able to freely discuss this, um, um, you know, amongst the intelligence community. So, and so there's probably multiple concerns there. I mean, one is that if you're, if you're not able to you know, you've, the Navy is having problems with these things, right? But they're not able to discuss, you know, these objects and have it taken seriously. So now, now what do you do? Um, in 2015, mm -hmm. for example, the they were having near da nearly daily encounters with UFOs. Um, and so you've got pilots who are not trained for these types of encounters. 
Some of these were happening in the Persian Gulf area while they were operating, you know, so that's a, you've got a military campaign going on. These guys are going on bombing runs on in Syria, and they've got to fly through UFOs be, over the Persian Gulf and then go to Syria and then conduct their military operations and come back. And that's a huge hazard. I mean, you don't, you don't need a pilot shaken, you know, from a UFO encounter and then go into a war zone. That's mm -hmm. extremely dangerous. And so that's one reason why when people say, oh, they're just drones and the U.S. is just testing them. No, you're not going to test them by putting pilots in danger in a war zone. Um, mm -hmm. That's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. What are some other arguments against them being drones? I mean, first, their, their accelerations that we estimated are, are way off the charts. You, um, people can't handle much more than, you know, than 10, 10 to 15 um, Gs for any period of time. Uh, 13 Gs, um, the new F-35 fighter, I think is rated for 13 and a half Gs. And at 13 and a half Gs, its wings will rip off. So you can't accelerate an airplane more than about 13, 15 G. Um, oh, some missile frames can handle, handle higher accelerations. Um, they can maneuver up to about 30 Gs of acceleration. And some can withstand, um, structurally withstand up to about 60 Gs. Um, so most of our equipment can't handle, our equipment can't handle more than 100 Gs. And um, and that's and, in one direction, let alone stopping and then turning around. Yeah, well, I mean, it doesn't matter whether you stop and turn around because you've got so many Gs here and then so many Gs again. So they're doing it over and over again. It's it's insane. And what are and, the Gs associated with these craft? Well, the, the highest one we estimated was about 5,700 Gs. Um, that was the one picked up on radar by um, Senior Chief Kevin Day while he was on the USS Princeton with the Nimitz Carrier Group. And that's the one that drops from 28,000 feet to sea level in 0.78 seconds. So you're looking at over 5,000 Gs of acceleration in that case. The other situations were a bit lower. Um, I think the lowest ones we had were maybe, I think the um, the video from the 2004 Nimitz video when it, when the object, when the targeting computer loses track and the thing takes off to the left, you're looking at about 78 Gs. The object's moving to the left and away from the, from the airplane at that point. Hmm. See, what strikes me about this paper is going through it, it, the mathematics isn't beyond high school or beyond first year, that's for sure. And I'm right. wondering, why is it, why hasn't an analysis like this, which seems like anyone could have done it, why hasn't it been done before? Is um, it simply I the think, stigma against analyzing I think aliens? that's the problem. I mean, you've got, you've got numerous capable physicists who have commented on these things and you've got enough information to basically to do a back of the envelope estimation of the acceleration and they're more willing to say well it's probably an atmospheric effect who knows who knows what it could be that's usually the response you get from a professional physicist which is problematic <clears throat> this is a calculation they ought to be able to do who else in the physics community professional physics community is studying this besides you and your co-author ah uh, well let's see my um a colleague of mine matthew shidagas at um university of albany is also studying this um other physicists i know of a few um people let's see i don't know if they're all physicists um some are engineers do you know of any physicists who are interested but tell you this behind closed doors? Yeah, that's basically the, the situation. You've got a number of people who are interested in studying this, and the problem is there's a paucity of data. We don't, we don't have any real data to work with um, for the most part. You have you know witness testimony, and some of that paper is based on witness testimony, and we we did the best we could with it um and 
and I think it gives you a ballpark estimate of what was observed. But but you have to you really want um, you really want radar data. You really want to be able to triangulate positions with multiple cameras. You want to do all sorts of things like this. That would be ideal. Are these spacecraft getting faster with time? What I mean by that is, let's say someone was analyzing Earth's craft. I imagine that what they would see is our top speed would increase over the decades, because it has. However, with these crafts, do you see them as being predominantly the same since the 60s or since the 50s? Since you guys, That's, since you that's a good analyzing? question. I mean, I don't think that we have that information. Um, you'd have to look over, look at them for a very long period of time and... There have been sightings of objects like this, and if they are alien spacecraft, which we really haven't proven that that's the case yet, um, the, you know, if they are alien spacecraft, then we wouldn't know, you know, from some of the Roman reports of flying shields, uh, we aren't able to estimate speeds and, and accelerations in those cases. We don't have that detailed information. So, what's the Romans' report of flying shields? Uh, there's several there's several reports in Roman history of um, or Orbis Clypeus I think they're called um, but they're called they're flying shields basically and so I can send you references for this there's a um, there's a couple of papers um, one on UFOs in classical antiquity and um, and another paper on the same topic yes do you mind making a note to send that to me later. Yeah, certainly. <clears throat> You're only sending me about Romans, or are you sending me? Is there a list of UFO sightings or potential UFO sightings across history? There's a book um, by Jacques Vallée. Um, I keep hearing called, about this person. Called Wonders, it. called Wonders in the Sky, and he has a compilation of of curious accounts, basically that could be interpreted as you know maybe the same type of phenomena. Jacques Vallée, huh? Is he still alive? Yeah. Maybe yeah, he lives in the Bay Area. Okay. I know that this is... Mm, as a physicist, you want to stay within what you know. But if you don't mind speculating, why do you think they're shutting down our nuclear devices? Do you think that that's just a side effect? It's inadvertent? Like mm -hmm. maybe when they accelerate, that happens for whatever reason? Or do you think it's purposeful? Why do they selectively shut it down in this area and only at certain times? That's a good question. I don't know how, I don't know the manner in which they were shut down. Not, I mean, this, this stuff is still, I mean, I don't think, I don't think the military has admitted that that's actually happened. You, you have people who work at these sites who claim that it happened. Um, the most detail I've heard was from Robert Salas, and he said that, I believe it was him, and he said that it was a failure of the, um, basically a failure of the of the navigation and guidance systems and that then led to a shutdown so that's curious because now if you have the inertial nav you know inertial navigation systems failing you know could that be due to how the craft operates so maybe it's just a side side effect Hmm, hmm. I mean, I, I mean, I, at this point, you know, this is extremely hypothetical. So I am just making up stories here. But I mean, if you have a craft that basically is somehow warping space time or affecting space time, and you've got an inertial navigation system sitting nearby that could affect it. So and then if their systems are set up so that they shut down whenever one of these things goes haywire, then the UFO flying over it could be enough to trigger that to shut down. Is it on purpose? Is it an accident? I don't... I mean, these these things have to be studied, and we have just gotten to the point where people are admitting that they're real. I mean, after, after 80 years, I think that's a little... To me, I find that a little scary. And we've had this, this going on for about 80 years, and it took us 80 years to decide that it's they're real, um, but we still don't know what they are you know, nor what they're doing here. 80 so. years, you're referring to the 50s? Or from the, the 40s. 40s, yeah, late 40s. Yes. Yeah. There aren't any reports from the U.S. government of UFOs prior to the 40s? I don't know about from the U.S. government. There are reports of the UFOs prior to that, um, easily into the 1800s, numerous ones, yeah.
by ship captains and things like this. These things have been seen for a long time, which is another argument against them being American or Russian Chinese drones. Um, they've been observed well before people could fly. So mm -hmm. there's someone who came out recently. I believe they're Israeli talking mm -hmm. about UFOs. I don't know. I forgot the person's name. I don't know the story. Do you mind edifying me as well as the audience? Oh, yeah. Well, that was an interesting story. I don't remember his position and I don't remember his name, but he was in the high up in the Israeli military. And he claimed Ham that... Ashed. Ham Ashed or Haim Ashed. Yeah. Is he the one who. Israeli claimed... director of the space program, it said. Right. So is he the one that claimed that they were in contact with, with alien, okay. alien civilizations? I have a question or... here for Avi Loeb from earlier today that talks yeah. about this. So the question was, okay, I would like to hear Avi Loeb's opinion on the claims of former Israeli director of the space program, Haim Ashed, brought forward. He must have heard about this, so-and-so. They went through the news briefly. Mm, was it a hoax? And I guess this person isn't recapitulating what Hen or Hem Ashed said, because he's assuming Avi Loeb already knew about it. Some government officials, you know, have had some pretty... Um, pretty exciting or interesting claims and it's you know these still aren't substantiated so it's, it's it's difficult it's difficult to know how much of it is a claim how much of it is a mistake how much of it is a problem with the individual <laughs> you, you you know we still have all of those questions when i spoke to jeremy corbell he seemed to think that the aliens were shutting down the nuclear arms as a flex of their sovereignty. And, well, what you're saying is it might be inadvertent. I'm also wondering, why is it that people can come out like David Fravor and so on, other people, like you mentioned, from the government, and not be sued by the government or shushed by the government or simply destroyed, killed? How are they allowed to speak about it? I know you don't particularly like Bob Lazar or believe Bob Lazar, but let's imagine Bob Lazar is correct. Let's just imagine. How is he allowed? There are people like him, maybe not to the same degree. Right. I don't... That's a good question. I don't know. Um, I don't know much about workings in the intelligence community, so I'm not sure how they would operate. They may have um, opted to eliminate individuals in the past. Um, I think... At this point, it would be rather, you know, it would be fishy and would probably draw more attention than anything. So I don't know if, I don't know. And, you know, if they, you know, if you have a lawsuit where you sue them for talking about this, well, then now you've basically admitted that it's true or some aspect of it's true. And so that would be a problem, too something else that's puzzled me about aliens at all is that our rate if i'm just going by our rate of technological improvement is drastic every decade and for sure every century so some people would critique every decade like peter Thiel, but at least every century that's for sure and when you take a look at let's imagine these aliens are going back to their planet that takes a couple years it from some it'll other take, time well, frame. It'll take, it'll, it may yeah, take them a day Proper so. time, they can do it in right. a few, depending on their right. accelerations, it could be a few days to a few months. Um, for for us, it could take, it, for us, it could take a thousand years or a hundred, couple hundred years. So, yeah. So let's just imagine they're going back to their little alien civilization in some other planet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then <clears> I would <throat> imagine that that planet has increased its age by maybe a few decades. Then I would imagine that when they come back, they should be far more technologically advanced. Each So every decade for us, when they're going and coming back, presuming they're going and coming back, I don't see why it should look the same at all, because I would imagine that if it was us, we would look vastly different every century or so, especially century from now, maybe our planes look like triangles. Maybe a century from maybe 200 years from now, our planes would look like dust. And then maybe farther, it'll look like a planet and so on. You understand the idea. Yeah, yeah. So why do you think it is that there's somewhat of a constancy <clears throat> of the reports in terms of how they look, a visual inspection, maybe even their speed of aliens, given that we are so quick with our technological advancement and they're presumably far more advanced than us, which means their trajectory of, let's say, Moore's Law or whatever it is that they follow should be 
they should be farther along in the exponential curve. No, that's an excellent that's an excellent question, and I <clears throat> I have a hypothesis that could answer that. And it <clears throat> and I came up with this in response to the general reaction of so 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 it's we 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 know well that if you can get a craft up to um relativistic speeds <clears throat> if you could engineer something like this so mm -hmm. yes huge engineering feat whatever. we don't even know Got how it. you'd pull it off Doesn't whatever matter. yeah but if you could then time dilation works in your favor it works in the favor of the traveler right so so you could you could conceivably leave your home world let's say you come from a thousand light years away you leave your home world and you travel to earth and you can travel close to the speed of light so you can get here in a few weeks so it's a few week trip to earth that's nice for you um it will be it'll take about a thousand years if if that planet's a thousand light years away from earth it'll take a thousand years in the galaxy frame so a thousand years will pass on earth and a thousand years will pass at home and then now they hang out here, they go into, you know, they land in a meadow and can, and I chose that on purpose, um, and take some biological samples and then they take off and head home. Now, <clears throat> on the way home, it's another thousand light years. So for us in the galaxy's frame, it's going to take another thousand years for them to get home. Um, maybe a couple weeks for them again. So for them, what was a, you know, a few month trip um, has turned into a 2,000 year trip back at home. And the argument, you know, while, while relativity would work in favor of the traveler, the question is who would do that? Because what society would ever conceive of a mission that would take 2,000 years? Because the people who designed the mission are never going to see the results of it. And the travelers are going to come back to a culture that's totally different than the culture they left because of the 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 um, reasons that you're stating. So so why would anyone do this? Well, the the supposition is that they are going to go home um, and that they live on a planet. And I think that's you know, that that's what we have implicitly assumed there. What we've neglected to remember is that even on Earth, there exist nomadic tribes, and there still exist nomadic tribes. So you could pull this off if you were a nomadic society, not a planet-bound society. So imagine, you know, you and me, we want to go space traveling, but we don't want to be 10, you know, 1,000 years apart. Um, I'll head off to... Um, to the star Rigel or something 900 light years away, you pick another place to go about about as distant. And we plan to meet back up here at, you know, a certain time in the future. So we can plan our trip accordingly so that we come back here at the same time. And it may be 2000 years in Earth's future, but, you know, we don't care. We can still meet up and compare notes and then we can travel off again. So you can imagine that you could have a whole breakaway civilization like this, where it literally is a civilization of travelers. And that's what they do. They travel and they travel and they explore and they periodically meet up. They have meetup points and meetup times that are all prearranged or they have some algorithm for this. And um, they can then exchange goods. They can exchange information and travel again. And what they're basically doing is they're using relativity in their favor, using time dilation in their favor, and they're basically, but but they're not just space traveling; they're also time traveling into the future, right? So they're they're traveling through space, interstellar space, but they're also traveling through time by racing forward into the future with respect to the rest of the galaxy. So all of them and their friends are also traveling around to meet up at the same two thousand year future relative to the galaxy. Yeah, they might not have, they might not have a single meetup place. They might have multiple meetup places and just randomly meet up, but yeah, you could do it various ways. And if that was the situation, then you could take advantage of relativity to travel, you know, galactic distances. And um and the advantage is I mean it would be very interesting because you could um so imagine that you accelerate 
you know, at a thousand, if you could accelerate at a thousand G, like, you know, similar to some of these objects we've observed, you could accelerate at a thousand G halfway, decelerate at a thousand G the other half, you can get from one side of the galaxy to the other in just a couple weeks, a couple months. Um, so, so let's say it takes you three months to get from one side of the galaxy to the other, and then you can come back, and when you come back, it's taking you a six-month trip, but, you know, in the galaxy's frame, it's going to be about 100,000 years later. So you get to travel through time, and, and so now your perspective of the universe is very different. Um, first, mm -hmm. and first, when people look at you, they're going to see the same ships. You're, you're traveling in the same craft. And why do these craft not evolve? Because it's actually the same one. <laughs> it could actually be the same craft. So the same craft that was observed in Roman times could literally be the same object with the same, you know, beings in it, you know, 2,000 years later. They could literally be the same That's objects. Fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. So let's imagine this is a 10-day journey for them. And, and for like, them, it's just time for frame. them, it's a couple days. Yeah. So they would be so they might be very now for them. We are ephemeral. Right. And um, because they're when they come back, you and I are going to be gone. So there's no point in making friends. There's no point in landing on the White House lawn and introducing yourself to the president, because the next time they come back, the United States isn't even going to be here. It'll be something else. Another mm. culture. Hmm. So there's no point in getting to know the locals. So it could explain why they, you know, and, and if they study, you could then actually study a civilization. So their concept of a civilization and how you study civilizations would be very different. You can actually watch civilizations evolve. Right, right. And we're kind of like fruit flies to them, right? <laughs> so they could... Uh -huh. That's right. That's it's fascinating, fascinating. So it would be like, imagine for the people listening to get some, to get another analogy for me as well, is I'm pressing play on a movie and then I'm speeding up the movie. You know, you can do that on Google. You can speed up by 2x, but imagine right. you can speed up by 300x or a thousand or whatever it may be, a million x. And then every once in a while you come into the room, you're like, oh, that's an interesting part of the movie. Then you walk out of the room, then you come back. Okay, so for you, it's just a couple days, and you have a few of your friends who are doing something similar. So from the movie's perspective, if they were to look out, they would see, oh, there's someone who has similar characteristics as the person before. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Fascinating, fascinating. Why do you think it is that aliens look somewhat like us? At least, when, at least from the reports, and again... Right, right. And again, we're taking some of these reports to be serious because just like we're taking some of the reports of the craft to be serious, it seems like it's not that wild. They're not octopus. They're people with two eyes, four limbs. So that's a good question. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. I would imagine that a poss if if that's really the case, then I imagine that the it could very well be a, a situation of convergent evolution. Right. Um, and we, we don't really understand yet how, you know, different environmental factors affect evolution. But, you know, we can look at Earth's history and get some ideas. So uh, fish shapes, right? Fish shapes. The fish shape works great in water, right? Nice and streamlined if you're shaped like a fish. And there have been other things with fish shapes, right? The same shapes you've had. Um, you have fish that are fish shaped. You have reptiles that are fish shaped, and you, the ichthyosaurs, right? And you have um, mammals that are fish shaped, whales and dolphins. So that same shape evolved multiple times because it's an efficient shape. Um, so having two free hands is very useful to building spaceships. So maybe. If you look like an optic octopus and you're very brilliant, you don't, you know, or if you're a dolphin, dolphins don't have thumbs. <laughs> Go back to an onion article. <laughs> where you said dolphins don't have thumbs, so they're not going to build spaceships. It doesn't matter how smart they are. Yeah, that's not going to happen. And so it really could be something like that. Another, just to go off on a speculative jump, I've heard this said by some of the people who have encountered aliens or supposedly encounter aliens that we're an experiment so one is that okay 
this is just what <clears throat> happens with convergent evolution. But another is that they somehow caused us. And then that's why there's a correlation. And that one is fascinating because I remember hearing someone say, it might have been Lazar, it might have been someone else say that, I don't think it was Lazar, someone say that the aliens referred to us, you know, this is obviously presuming that we can speak to them or that they, it's all true. The aliens refer to us as carriers or of vessels of something. Of what? Now that's scary. Let's just imagine it's true. Of what? Of consciousness? Of a soul? Of biological material? Of what? Hmm. Yeah, some of these, yeah, some of these stories are very strange. And it's really hard to know what to make of them. Um, it's it's far easier to just say it's got to be nonsense, right? <laughs> and we've but we've been down that road s several times now. Well, you you just gave me such an you just I don't know was this something you've been working on for a little while that little theory where they come in and out and yeah for for about a year yeah about no I came up with it about a, two years ago and I presented that idea at the one of the conferences with the Society for um, Scientific a coalition for UAP studies. So I presented it to them. I have a video of that talk that I can give you the link to. Please write that down if you don't mind, because even if I don't watch it, which I hopefully do, I hopefully get the time to watch it, I'll still include it in the description so other people can watch it. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've started writing that up as a paper, but I haven't finished that yet. <clears throat> Right, there are two facts about aliens that always troubled me about them. So one is that they look too much like us. It was too human, in other words. But we just found a way to get around that one conversion to or two, they caused us in some way. And then number two is that the rate of technological progress should be should be so far, so quick that they would be unrecognizable. There would be no through line to even call them aliens across the decades, especially across the centuries. But you've managed to find a way around that as well. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. So now what I'm wondering, I'm sorry to get off on this idea shooting back and forth. But no, these are fun is, things to think about. <laughs> great, great, great. Now what I'm wondering is, imagine if I have a, let's just say a fish tank, for lack of a better word. And that fish tank, I can turn up the rate at which Time passes on it. So again, this is like that movie analogy. It's going at a, a trillion times our speed. Okay, so I'm turning it up. What I want to do is I want to test out. Imagine I'm just testing out. How is life going to work in this scenario? So I can start it. Maybe it's even, there's a word for this, panspermia? Yeah. Right, okay. So I test out. What is this going to look like? Then I come back and I look. What is, hmm, I wonder if that's what's going on. I wonder if we are just some experiment for them. The whole alien abduction phenomenon is very strange. There's a lot of strange aspects to it. And one thing that bothers me is that the, if the number of people who claim to be abducted are, if that's actually correct, if they actually have been, then, then the question is why and what are they doing to them? Because you don't need to, you don't need to abduct a million people to do a scientific experiment on on the human body, right? Um, you only need a, maybe a thousand or so. So way too many people are getting abducted. So the question is, what is actually happening would be the next question I'd have if the, if the abductions are real, of course. Right, right. Have you found any credible evidence to the alien abductions? And have you found any material that's foreign embedded within some people? I know that some people claim. No, I know that there are is a group, at least one group, that is studying alien abductions in a more detailed way, but that's all that I know about. Okay, let's talk about Bob Lazar. Why are you suspicious of Bob Lazar? Not that I'm not suspicious or suspicious, I'm just curious, because someone who studies aliens, to me, they, they just want, they just accept what Bob says, especially because it validates what they've been thinking. Right. <clears throat> I'm suspicious because he has, supposedly has a background in physics. He claims to have a, have a master's degree in physics. And when he describes, he he's careful about describing the physics 
with enough detail to be tantalizing, but not enough detail for you to be able to tell whether it's correct or not. Can and that not simply be a function of ignorance? So, for example, he just doesn't know beyond that point because it's not clear how the craft work. That could be that could be part of it. He just might not know. Um, yeah, no, I mean that could be part of it. I just I just get the impression that that he's walking that he's. I get the impression he's purposefully walking that line between, you know, of, of giving enough information to be tantalizing and sound, sounding, um, you know, realistic without giving you enough information to be able to test it. Have you watched any of his technical talks? I only know of one. Maybe there are more. I don't know if I sent it to you. There is one no, from I the don't, 80s. I don't know. I would like to see it, I guess. I'd like to watch it. I should have sent that to you because he talks about how he thinks the craft work and there are diagrams. And then he also refers to element 115. I'm sure you've heard that over and over. Right. Which is interesting because he associates the strong force as gravity number two or gravity number one, which is to me, one of the reasons I got interested in this, Kevin, is because I'm interested in the fundamental laws of the universe. And so how do you unify QFT with GR? Okay. Right. Now, if you're claiming that the strong force has something to do with gravity, that to me is extremely interesting. Right. Yeah. Have you heard him talk about the strong force in that manner? And then what's no, right? No, I've, I've heard it? that he's said that, but that's all that I I know about it. I would, yeah. So I'd like to watch that talk. Actually, that would be fun. Me and you have to have another conversation after you watch. That, <laughs> all right. If you don't mind, Certainly. that would be no, wonderful. No, I would love to. Okay, you said, I've been in contact with Eric Bard, who is currently a PI at Skinwalker Ranch. PI meaning private investigator? Uh, no, principal investigator. Like, he's the principal scientist. He is working for um, Brandon Fugel, who owns the ranch. And um, and they're performing their own studies. So, so I don't really get a lot of information from him about, you know, events or details. So... Um, but we have talked about, you know, possibly, you know, sharing information at some point. He's contacting you because you're one of the few that are actually taking this seriously, or you contacted him, or what? I contacted him initially because I was, I was working and I'm still working on trying to get satellite imagery of UFOs or UAPs. And since they had had sightings on the ranch, um, and they know the place and the time, they might, those would be good candidates to get um, archived satellite imagery. So you could get, get a third party confirmation that, you know, from space that, yeah, there's a, there's a disc there <laughs> hovering over the ground. Why can't you do that with any of the other reports? You you can obviously some of them are older, but what about Nimbus? Yeah, well you should you should be able to, and I've been working in that direction. So the difficulties I've had mainly have to do with um, my contacts at the satellite companies. You know they're usually doing this as a favor, um, pulling images, and and once you know we get to the point where they realize that I'm looking for UFO images, then I think it's like, well, you know, their opinion becomes more like, well, I have real work to do. <laughs> so, well, that's going to have to sit up, go to the back burner. It's unfortunate because I think it's a, you know, potentially you have a big discovery and this third party data would be really useful. And um, so I, I, I'm still hopeful that we can do something like this. There are satellites orbiting the Earth that are taking pictures of virtually every part of the Earth and they're third party. That doesn't violate any laws by the government. No, I don't. I, I don't know what the laws are, but um, but I know that they that there are several companies that have global coverage, um, and very you know in relatively short time intervals. So that's interesting. I didn't know about that. As for spacecraft, so this is we're nearing the end of our spacecraft question. Then we'll get to the physics. Okay. Great. So as for the. UFO spacecraft, do you imagine that they're taking advantage of some new physics? And when I say new physics, what I mean is physics 
that we don't understand. So maybe like Lazar is correct with the strong force being a gravitational one, or maybe there's a fifth force, or maybe they're utilizing your partially ordered set manner of constructing space-time from the ground up. Or do you think it's just technological sophistication in the same way that a cell phone, if the cell phone isn't using any new physics, quote-unquote, since the 1950s, we pretty much could understand how this operated. It's just the technical sophistication. Do you imagine it's technical sophistication or the utilization of new physics? It's a good question. <clears throat> I suspect that there is some new physics. And the reason I think that is because we don't see... These things appear to be violating conservation of momentum. So when the object takes off, you know, at this huge acceleration, there ought to be something moving the other way, right? Um, and that we don't observe that. So you have that problem. The fact that they move through air almost effortlessly with no sonic booms um, is a problem. The, uh, yeah, so for instance, that the tic-tac object that was observed on radar to drop from 28,000 feet to sea level in 0.78 seconds. At the midpoint, it had to be going about 35,000 miles an hour. That's Mach 60, <laughs> right? That's great. And, that, and that's as fast as the New Horizons probe that went to Pluto. So that little, that little tic-tac object, basically, as it dropped to sea level, accelerated to the speed of the New Horizons probe within um, 0.4 seconds, which is really remarkable. Um, and so it did that without a sonic boom, and um, and it's not clear how that's possible. So it really does look like there's some new physics involved. Um, and then for people who then question the, you know, there's uh, the question always often comes up: Why do you assume that these are ex these are spacecraft? And the answer is really simple: because they travel at the speeds of spacecraft. <laughs> that's they travel at those speeds, and they travel with accelerations that could would not only make them viable interstellar craft, but it would make them excellent interstellar craft. So, Do you believe that they have some base on Earth? That's actually where I thought you were going with your little theory before, when we were talking about why is it Oh, the traveling and the, events. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I thought that you were going to say that, well, perhaps... They're not going home. Perhaps they're not leaving Earth. I thought you were going there. But do you believe that they have some space, sorry, some base on Earth, maybe under the water, maybe on the other side of the moon, as some people I think there's not? been there's been a lot of suspicion that, you know, a lot of talk that there could be underwater bases. Um, you know, 75% of the Earth's surface is water, and we really have very little access to it. So if you are going to hide out somewhere, that's perfect. Um and then, to be honest, if you're if you're aquatic in the first place, let's say that you come from an aquatic environment, aquatic environments on planets are going to be much better to live in than atmospheric environments. <clears throat> Atmospheres have a low heat capacity, so the temperature varies a lot throughout the day even, right? You get huge temperature variations. Um, and then going from planet to planet, you have huge temperature variations in the atmosphere. You know, go to Mars and you're looking at 100 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. You go to Venus and you're looking at 800 degrees Fahrenheit. It's dramatic. And the air pressure is dramatically different, you know, from planet to planet. So here we have one atmosphere of air pressure. You go to Mars, it's one one hundredth. And you go to Venus, it's 100 times. You know, so you've got four orders of magnitude of variation of air pressure. And... And um, and then, of course, air doesn't do much for protecting you from cosmic rays and meteorites, right? So there's all sorts of problems with living on a surface protected only by an atmosphere. But if you live in an ocean, you know, going to another planet with an ocean is actually a pretty good thing. If you if you know it's a water ocean, then a water ocean on another planet is going to be between the temperatures of you know, 32 degrees Fahrenheit and, you know, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So, so the temperatures aren't going to change dramatically from ocean to ocean, going from one planet to another. And you can 
And because water's not compressible, the, the pressures aren't going to change that dramatically either. Um, the pressures are going to be a function of gravity. But, you know, a very deep ocean on Europa, the pressure, you know, the pressure halfway down, maybe 30 miles down into Europa's ocean is going to be similar to the pressure at the bottom of our oceans, only five miles down. So... So you can actually find a nice place to, to hide out, hang out if that's your the pressure you're used to. You know, the only different the main differences are going to be um be chemicals dissolved in the ocean. So are there some chemicals that are poisonous to you in that ocean or biologics? You know, if there's you know, bacteria and things like this that could be problematic too. But otherwise, going from one ocean to another is almost going to be, going pro for the most part, you know, for survival purposes, will be very similar. Do you think that if we were to pass over an alien civilization, presuming they're underwater, and we were able to see them, that they would sense us and then relocate quickly, or they would just allow us to observe them? Just speculating. Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. Um... Yeah, it's hard to speculate what somebody else would do. I'm, I'm not even sure what humans would do in that case, so... Right. Do you think that they're building a base, or do you think that they're, somewhat, they're somehow living in their craft underground? Because there's not much room in those crafts, and at least I don't imagine there to be. I don't know. A 300-foot disc would be pretty good. Yes. <laughs> it depends how many, how many people you have in there. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Hmm. That's fascinating. This whole topic, there's so many other questions I had for you, but I just feel like exploring this and exploring this. And just so you know, I'm not someone who's into conspiracy theories or strange phenomenon. I'm much like yourself. I'm pretty sure this just like you. But this is absolutely fascinating. And it's it's even frightening because what the heck are we? Like, I, and now I'm wondering how much of this is actually just an experiment by them because well that to me makes the most sense as to why they I don't think convergent evolution would produce intelligent creatures that look like us each time I don't think so it could be the case but I don't buy it only because we have one data point and maybe aliens are two data points hmm, 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 hmm. strange yeah well the problem is that the thing the thing that I wonder about is if they're if they're DNA based right if they have the same kind of biochemistry that we do, then then it's hard to imagine that we're not related in some way, right? So are they from, you know, so then you start wondering about all the possible, are they from here, <laughs> which would be very surprising. Um, are they from here? Did we really miss something big? Um, did they come from here originally and go somewhere else and are coming back? Did they, are they from another, another system where oh, there was some kind of panspermia between, you know, that led to, you know, biology spreading from one system to another so that we're of the same, you know, so that we're somehow biologically related to one another. Otherwise, I'd imagine you would be very much you know, the situation you would expect would be very much more like what um, Stuart Kaufman from the Santa Fe Institute would have described, where you have the biology is probably very different, and you run the risk of, you know, you don't want to touch them because you're going to, you know, your biology is incompatible, so there's going to be all sorts of horrible chemical reactions. Um, so You wouldn't want to touch them? Yeah, well, you don't want to come in contact with their organic molecules because you don't know what kind of reactions you'd have. Um, so you because well, so so in Stuart Kaufman's talked about autocatalytic sets where you get sets of organic molecules that autocatalyze, right? And so our biology is basically one whole system of of these types of chemicals. So we're all compatible with each other, but. If you get another bi organic molecule in that's foreign, you know, that's going to interact with different ways and create all sorts of new types of molecules. So I haven't heard of that before. Yeah. So that is Stuart Kaufman. 
Stuart Kaufman, yeah. <clears throat> autocatalytic sets or autocatalytic molecules or what? The autocatalytic sets, I think it was. And he, I think it was his book, At Home in the Universe, I believe it is. <clears throat> but, you know, the implications from that is if there were aliens who were truly alien, the U, and they were, but they were, you know, made of, you know, they're carbon based, then the chance that the molecules are similar is, you know, are. It's going to be it's going to be problematic. Huh. Why do you think they mutilate cattle? That's a good question. I don't know. I <laughs> I don't understand. I don't know if they do. I mean, we the real. I mean, the real answer to a lot of these is we don't know anything yet about these things. So, and we don't know if these things are all related. Okay, sorry. What could be a reason they mutilate cattle? Let's say it like that. Yeah, are, are they doing experiments? Are they you know are they collecting data? I don't. That's a good question. Why cattle? I don't know. Well, cattle are the most plentiful of all the animals, actually by weight, at least. Hmm. Yeah, I had a I had a thought I had a an idea and I'll share the idea with you. So this is, you know, not even at the level of a hypothesis, right? Or this is just a thought. So Ray Stanford, who has studied UFOs in the seventies, refers to a sense of he calls it euphoria, spelt UFO. R-I-A, euphoria. Okay. And he says that when you are near one of these craft, you have a feeling of euphoria. And um, he's recorded electromagnetic um, variations in the electromagnetic field from these things, and those variations happen around 12 hertz. So that's interesting because 12 hertz is close to the alpha rhythm frequencies that you get in the visual cortex when you close your eyes. Okay, wait, sorry, I just want to make sure I'm understanding this. So who's yeah. this person who's saying this? Ray Stanford. Okay, so Ray Stanford is saying that there's a phenomenon called euphoria. Yeah. Okay, and he's defining this phenomenon right now. He's not referring to something else. He's yeah, the phenomenon is a feeling that you get the sense of euphoria actually um it's spelled the so it's related way. to euphoria it's yeah. related to happiness yeah. because yeah. i know that some people feel abject terror yeah cer oh certainly yeah but 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 he says that when the craft are just near even if you're not aware of them you'll get that sense of euphoria and he's he claims to use this to go you know he'll have that feeling and then go outside and oh yeah there it is there's one um and takes photos and so he's done that in the past and that's what he claims so I so I was curious about this because he had also measured uh, variations in the electric field that are around on the order of twelve hertz, which is close to our alpha variations. Where where they're reported? Yeah. So when you when he is taking photos of a UFO, he'll have he has equipment that measures you know EM EM fields. So he'll measure the electric and magnetic field, and you get variations oscillations at about twelve hertz are prominent uh -huh. sometimes. So the so that kind of caught my attention because and this is where the thought comes in, right? This is his mm -hmm. claim. You know, I have not seen this myself, I've not measured it, and so I I can't you know testify to the to how true it is. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my thought what struck me was that twelve hertz is close to your alpha rhythm and and um and so if you have strong electric and magnetic, oscillating electric and magnetic fields near these things, you're going to induce currents into the brain. And if these currents are at 12 hertz, they could entrain the alpha rhythm. You can actually entrain alpha, alpha rhythms. So, um, so you could entrain, entrain an alpha rhythm, which, would, which could very well make you feel, you know, calm or restful or sleepy or, you know, euphoric or something like that. Now, of course, this could be overridden by the terror of seeing, you know, a, you know, this craft and, you know, aliens coming out of it or whatever might happen. But, but it, that was my, that was my thought. Well, maybe, maybe that's where the euphoria comes from. It's comes from these oscillations in the electric field. And then it made me think that, um, and I had this thought watching the video from Skinwalker Ranch 
of the disc in the sky with the cow dying, right? The cow was dying um, while the disc was hovering over it. Um, Where was this from? This was uh, taken at Skinwalker Ranch, and it was in their 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 TV series, their documentary series. Right. What's the host name? Dear Travis. Travis Taylor. Travis Taylor. Yep. Is that the series you're referring to? That's the one. Yeah. I would like to talk to Travis. Have you ever spoken to him? Yeah, I have. I've met him. He's an interesting guy. Yeah. Yeah. So so in that in that case, you had you had the you had the the disc is hovering oh, some distance above the cow. The cow actually died there, and and it was acting funny beforehand, and it made me think. Well, the cow's brains are different sizes, and I don't know what frequency their alpha rhythm is at. So I thought, what if what if these craft are inducing currents into the cow's brain, and then it makes them panic or something instead of mm -hmm. giving them the sense of euphoria? Ah, 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 ah! That's fascinating. And so maybe these maybe I like they're. That. So what if what if they're killing the cows by accident? So here's just a thought. They're killing the cows by accident, right? And then they're trying to figure out why the cows are dying whenever they fly near them, right? So then they go down and they did take some samples and collect some data to figure out why the cows are dying. Um, maybe that, <laughs> it's, it's a thought, that's all. Yeah. It's a fun thought. It's fun to think of things, <laughs> and so. Yeah, <clears throat> yes, yes. There does seem to be an association with radiation, especially magnetic, sorry, electromagnetic radiation and these craft. From that TV series, I recall them saying that all of the cow, that's cows at Skinner Walker, were placed into one room the size of this condo, and it was magnetized. Do you remember that? That all the oh, cows yeah, were placed yeah, in there, I've and it heard was that, yeah. locked. Yeah, there was something bizarre. Yeah, there was, well, there's several bizarre stories <laughs> having to do with the cattle. Well, now, what the heck can explain that? I don't. I don't know what can explain half of what I've heard happens at Skinwalker Ranch. So that's how. That is a. Okay, let's talk about Skinwalker further. That's a whole other kettle of fish. <laughs> let's open this kettle of fish. With Skinwalker, there seems to be reports of ghosts, Bigfoot, and so like, every phenomenon. That's pretty paranormal. much everything you've ever heard of. It happens there, which is very, very bizarre. What's the relationship? What could be? How about that? What could be the relationship between UFOs and the rest of other paranormal activity? Like, wh wh why? So here's one. Here's one simple answer. That when the aliens are nearby, in the same way that they induce a, a different conscious state, then in the same way that low-frequency sounds, I'm sure you've heard, the, heard of this, low-frequency sounds can produce reports of ghost sightings, maybe there's something similar happening. But then that wouldn't explain any actual footage like or intersubjective right. agreement as to oh i saw an animal that looked like this over there i would right. imagine that it would just produce strange phenomena and each person would have a different yeah inter phenomenon. intersubjective agreement is a good term i've often heard yeah i wouldn't explain that you know i've heard professionals claim <clears throat> oh it's a mass hallucination and then I have to remind them, you know, that's not a thing either, right? <laughs> that's not a real phenomenon either. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know what could explain this.